In medieval times, the serfs were tied to the land and were sold to the land. America was a land of freedom. In America, the serfs were, were freed, but they weren't fully freed until we had the idea of the automobile. Henry Ford's uh, automobile freed the serfs. The, the, last, the last vestige of being tied to the land was, was the automobile, and it shattered the chains that tied the serfs to the land, and finally and forever. So the idea is, you know, if, if you have an automobile and you get fed up with things, you know, you can take off. California or bust. But normally, you know, when you actually use the car, normally you go to the store, you go to work, and you do things like that. The average trip is actually very short. You don't, you don't run off to Alaska. So, so mostly, you know, when you, you want to do transportation, you want to look towards electric trains uh, and rather than uh, airplanes because it's much more efficient. You know, so if we could have mass transit to get to work, that would be great. But there's a real place for a full function electric car. Now, most of our gasoline is burned on driving gas guzzlers to work. And there's 250 million gas guzzling cars of one sort or another, less or more gas guzzling on the streets of America. So that's what we're trying to think about, how to, how to deal with that problem, the problem of single person commuting. Now, out of the 250 million cars that are on the streets of America, there's only 328 about that are in the hands of the public that are full, full function electric cars. And why is this important? Well, uh, until you encounter an electric car, you know, you, you think that there's no alternative but gas guzzling and cars. And, and you drive a gas guzzling car. You know, I did too. My last car was an F-150 until I found out about electric cars in 1995. Uh, but uh, once you find that there is such a thing as an electric car, you, you know, you learn all about it and you realize that that really is, is satisfies almost all your driving needs. You know, if you really need to go a long distance, you know, most people take a plane or they go into Chicago or New York or San Francisco. I mean, you can drive if you like punishing yourself uh, but mostly, you know, for a 62 and a half mile commute one way per day, that's about the maximum. And that's easily handled with an electric car, existing technology, electric cars, as we can testify. You know, this is something that, you know, I've done for years is commute that sort of a distance in an electric car that has a hundred mile, 120 mile range, 150 mile range. And, you know, that's, that's an exceptional commute. So you find out about electric cars and you say, you know, this is great. I can charge it slowly at nighttime. This is an advantage, you know, because I can use electricity nobody else needs. And then you find out about solar power. And, you know, you say, well, I would like to make my own electricity. So you make your own electricity in the daytime. You know, right now we're producing electric that's powering our neighbors and, and helping the grid avoid outages. And then you therefore pay for your overnight charging of your electric car. Now you then avoid purchasing gas. Now the, the electric power on your roof, it turns out, the amortized cost is, is uh, less than the electric that it replaces. But when you use that electric to power a gas, uh, an electric car, you, the, the uh, actual money you used to spend on gasoline pays off your solar system in three years. You have a 33% return on investment. So in other words, in the last four years, we've driven 160 or 70,000 miles in two electric cars, avoiding the purchase of about 8,000 gallons of gasoline, which is at least $16,000, not counting tune-ups, smog checks, and other things that we've avoided, oil changes. And, and that money paid for more than paid for our solar system. And we also get all of our domestic electric for free. So I say we drive for free. We ride for free because we've already paid for our solar system years ago. And, and whatever we get now is, is, is available. So, you know, people find out about this. Hey, I can put in a solar system and get credits in the daytime, which I can use for overnight parking of a plug-in electric car. Where do I get an electric car? And that's what's been interdicted. General Motors and Chevron stopped uh, people from being able to get the kind of a car that has 150 miles range by, uh, by buying up and controlling the nickel metal hydride batteries. And, and that's right now Chevron's unit, Cobus, has, controls those batteries, and they have since they bought it, or acquired it on October 10th, uh, 2000, from General Motors, which had bought it in 1994. Now, perhaps lithium batteries will work, you know, and we're hoping they do. 
But until they do, the only kind of battery that works is nickel metal hydride or lead acid. It works a little bit. Uh, and and those, that's what's been stopped. Now, the, the deal is, the important thing is, if you can buy an electric car, uh, you can then put in a solar system and then pay for your solar system with avoided costs from driving. And as you use that money to pay off your solar system, the money that used to go to produce pollution by oil that produced nothing but pollution and left nothing behind but acid rain and, and terrible things and foreign oil wars, that money instead is paying for your solar system. You know, and people find out about this and they say, great, we love this. Well, how can I do it? Well, how do I get an electric car? You can buy solar, but you can't get an electric car. Out of all those 16 million cars that you can buy, not one is an electric car. You know, and that, that is the, the genius and power of the oil megalopoly, is that you cannot buy an electric car. And the reason is, once you find out about an electric car, you realize that there's a different kind of a freedom from being freed from the land. It's, it's a freedom from the oil monopoly and all of the bad things that petroleum is, is doing to us right now.